last week I turned 30 and I think this will be the most important or at least the most meaningful podcast I have ever produced or at least up until now it'll be the most meaningful one. And for this episode, it's a very, very special episode. I wanted to look at the last 30 years of my life and you know, try to figure out what are the biggest lessons learned. And I came up with 30, about 30, probably a little bit more, but I tried to summarize it down to the top 30 lessons learned. And even today, even as of right now, recording this podcast, one of the lessons I've learned is done is better than perfect. And I'll I'll get into much more details later in the podcast. But the, the general idea is I didn't really want to do this podcast right now because, you know, I don't know if I'm in the right mindset. I don't know if this is going to be as good as I would like it to be for this, like I said, very important podcast. But I wanted to get it done. And for those of you that don't know, about five years ago or so, maybe four or five years ago, I started a, another podcast called How to Do Your 20s Podcast. So for the last five years, I've been very much interested in self-improvement in your 20s. And it was always me asking the question, how do you do your 20s? And this episode isn't meant to necessarily provide an answer for everybody, but it's meant to be an answer for myself and the biggest lessons that I learned. And, and this will tie right in with the first lesson learned, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a second. But if you haven't yet, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, definitely go check out the How to Do Your 20s podcast. I'm probably going to take it down at the end of this year and, and maybe put it behind, um, make it so people, if they want to get it, they can sign up for my email list and they can get access to it. But it's actually, I have to pay every month that I have it. So I'm going to take that down soon. I'll keep it up for another month or two. But like I said, you know, my birthday was actually last week and I I recorded this episode. Some of you guys, I think might've even downloaded. I recorded this episode, the first, the part one of this episode, put it up and what ended up happening, the audio audio quality was a total junk. So I'm now having to re-record it. So that's the reason why there was not a podcast episode last week, but I'm, I'm very much excited for this. And as I was recording last time, this was almost kind of a cathartic experience. It was it was very interesting for me to start talking about what are some of the biggest lessons learned. So let me jump into the first lesson learned. And this episode is going to probably go a little bit all over the place. And this is probably going to end up being a three-part episode. I'll do my first 10 lessons learned. And they're not necessarily in any, in any specific order. But these are some of the most impactful ones for me. So the, the first and most important lesson learned that we have to get out of the way is what works for others, what works for me may not work for you. And this was, all of these lessons, to be honest with you, were very hard fought. Like I spent a lot of time, energy, going the wrong way to be able to find these. And something I should note before I get even any further into this is when someone has an idea and it's very revolutionary to them, that probably means that they're really bad at it. You'll you'll see, for instance, the first lesson learned for me, what works for others may not work for you. That was something that didn't cross my mind for a long time. I thought, oh, if successful people do X, Y, and Z, uh, if Tim Ferriss does it this way, that's how I should do it because it worked for him. Of course, it's going to work for me. I want to be more like this person. I should act more like this person. But the truth is, and, and this sounds so obvious saying it out loud, but everybody is so different. So when I say, you know, I found it really helpful to wake up early, you might think, oh, okay, well, I should wake up early. But no, you, you should test it out. I think when someone successful says that, not, not even to call myself successful, but when someone that you're trying to emulate or learn for them from says to do something, I think it's worth testing, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, you need to... You, you need to do it to be successful. So I, I spent a good amount of time, energy trying to be people I wasn't. And this is something you hear over and over again. And I, haven't, I definitely haven't cured myself of it. But as I list all these different lessons learned, if it doesn't jive with you, then ignore it. You know, and my hope is that at least one or two of these lessons learned really help improve your life, really make a big difference. I hope that you have an aha moment from these. But like I said, uh, for me specifically, let me give you a tangible example that will lead into my second lesson learned. And one thing I struggled with for most of my 20s, like since I quit my corporate job, was this idea that you need to 
focus on one idea, one business, one thing, period, and you need to focus all your energy into that. And I had a friend slash mentor who sadly I, I, I no longer really uh, talk with very much, I uh, talk with at all actually, we had a little bit of a falling out, but he basically said to me, you know, if you want to make money, that needs to be your solo focus. All you should focus on is making money. And I respected him. So I listened to that. All I would focus on was making money and not, and even within making money, it was, I was only focused on one specific business. And for me and my personality type, that is a huge uh, waste. So for me, one of the big things I realized is I need to have multiple buckets because if I just have one business, one idea that I'm constantly working at, I burn myself out. I like having multiple different companies, businesses. And currently I have B Dancer, which I don't spend a ton of time on, but that used to be my main thing. I have this podcast, I have my YouTube channel and I have Performance Nut Butter. And the YouTube channel and the, uh, the podcast are obviously within the same domain. Um, for those listening to the podcast, the YouTube channel is my name, Travis Marziani. And those watching the YouTube video, it's effective e-commerce, but I may end up switching it to my name as well. So what happens for me is I work really hard at one business and then I like to switch over to a different one. And maybe I do this once a week. Maybe I, I work really hard on one business for a month and then I switch over, but I like having different options. Another, another thing that I work on, another bucket we'll call it, is my own self-development. And the way I want you to visualize this, at least the way I think about it is, think about a bunch of water uh, jugs or water like faucets, a bunch of water faucets. And each of these water faucets are dripping out a little like drop of water. So we have three different buckets that are collecting these drops of water. And at the bottom of these buckets is a spout. And I can, I can, turn, I can open up a spout, but once that bucket runs out of water, if I keep that spout open and I keep trying to, you know, get water from that bucket, it's just, it comes out at a drip. And that's what happens with me. And, and, and so I guess what you need to do or what I need to do is then close that tap, go over to the other bucket and open it up. And by the time I get back to the first bucket, it'll be full with water again. And what this represents to me is when I work on a business, I have a ton of ideas, a ton of energy, a ton of creativity. And then once I've, I've implemented most of my ideas, I need to move on to a different project. Now, the kind of businesses I prefer and the, the kind of lifestyle I prefer is a ratcheting system. And so what I mean by that is that first bucket, let's call it performance nut butter. That first bucket, I work really hard on performance nut butter. And then at a certain point, I get burnt out on that. And I want to move on to the next thing, which might be my YouTube channel. And the good thing about a company like Performance Nut Butter is when I stop working on it, it still continues to make money. So I think of it as like a roller coaster going up a hill. The roller coaster doesn't go up a little bit and slide back. It goes up and it pretty much stays there. So with Performance Nut Butter, I was able to work on it, grow it. And then once I stopped, it would stay there. Uh, so I could go move on to something else. And when I got bored with the YouTube channel, I could go back to Performance Nut Butter. And once again, everyone's personality is different. Most, a lot of the most successful people focus on one business over and over again, and they're just going to crack that. That's not the way my brain works. And I think it's respect. I think that's going to be an overarching lesson for this podcast series is figure out how your brain works. In Greek times, they would say, know thyself, figure out what makes you tick, what you enjoy, what you love. Because if you aren't loving what you're doing, why, what do you do? What are you doing with your life? Uh, and, and we'll get back to that later. So let me get to lesson number three. And this is going to sound completely contradictory, but hear me out on this. And that is to focus on one variable at a time. So despite me saying, and, and it's funny, I'm catching myself as I'm saying this, despite me saying, you know, that my, my past friend slash mentor said to me, oh, you should focus on one thing. And I thought that was crazy. And I, I guess, let me elaborate. The reason I thought it was crazy the way he did it is when I had an interesting idea, I would beat it out of me. But I think that you shouldn't do that. I think you should go and do what excites you. So if you're working really hard on a business, you're burnt out, but you're really excited for something else, go do that something else. But let me explain the focus on one variable at a time, because I think this will help out a lot. And I think of life being four, five, six variables, at least big ones. And that would be, one would be your friends. 
Another one would be what you're doing. Another one would be where you live. Another one would be who you're dating. And another one would be family. Sadly, family is not necessarily something you have a lot of control over. But the other four, for most people, you do. Uh, I, to be fair, I'm lucky enough. I have a very good relationship with my family. But I understand if you do not, that might be a hard thing to fix. Um, another one actually might be health. So let, let, let's use that as an example. And... I personally think that if you're really trying to crack any one of them, what you should do is focus on that one variable. And I learned this method, funny enough, uh, I was taking a multivariable calculus class. I studied engineering in high or in college. And in multivariable calculus, the same is true in uh, multivariable algebra. You solve for one variable at a time. So you would take an integral, which is it's just a calculus type problem, problem that let's say it had X, Y, Z, and first you would solve it using X as a variable, but keeping Y and Z as constants, as, as basically treating them as if they were numbers. Uh, the same thing, just to make it a little bit more accessible, if you have two X plus Y equals one and three X plus two Y equals five, the way you would solve that equation is you solve for X. And in life, I think it's helpful to solve for one variable at a time. So my example, I have a lot of different examples with this, but originally when I quit my job, I moved to Miami. So I moved to Miami, I picked a new career, a new job, I started B Dancewear, and I, what else did I do? I had a whole bunch of new friends, I was doing a new workout routine, all, you know, all, my whole life, I just rolled the dice and tried to figure everything out in one swoop. I wasn't happy with that, so I figured, okay, let's try again. I'll move to Columbia, and I'll maybe I'll start a podcast, that's when I started the How To Do Your 20s podcast, maybe that will make me happy, and I'll hang out with a different group of friends, and I'll, I'll try some different dating. And I kept doing this over and over again, just rolling the dice, trying to figure out, hmm, will this make me happy? But in my opinion, it's better to, I don't want to use the word settle, but I think that, I, I think it's better to find things that you're happy with and realize that they're really good and that they are good enough. And an example would be, I knew that, you know what, there might be a better place for me than Santa Monica. But when I moved to Santa Monica and I started growing roots, I stopped thinking, where am I going to live next? So that part of my brain was then turned off. So this is the difference, I guess, between having the multiple buckets and limiting, one, uh, limiting your life to one variable at a time. Something like, for me, when I was moving around a lot, there was a part of my brain, 10% of my brain, that was constantly thinking, how long do I live, want to live in Brazil for? How long do I want to live in Buenos Aires for? You know, both uh, Vegas, I also live there. Is this something I want to keep doing? But once I said, all right, variable of where I live equals Santa Monica, hold this as a constant, that part of my brain was freed up to think about other things. Another example was I, I did, for the you know since I quit my job, I've done a decent amount of dating and... I think one of the best things I've done is getting a girlfriend for my personality type. Now I have a girlfriend. And I don't have to think, hmm, it's Friday night. Should I be uh, going out with my friends to try to meet a girl? Should I be doing X, Y, and Z? And, and don't get me wrong. There's a lot of benefits, obviously, to having a girlfriend. But one of them is I don't have to think about that anymore. That part of my brain that was in dating mode is now able to be freed up to focus on whatever my one variable is. And recently, obviously, up until pretty recently, it's been business. It's been trying to learn how to make money. So all these part of my brain, brains, all the different parts of my brain that were focused on trying to solve this equation are focusing all that energy at one variable. And this has been huge for me. I think a lot of people that are unhappy with their life aren't sure which element to tackle first and they try tackling all of them. And it's like solving a multivariable calculus problem. The human brain was not set up for that. So focus on one variable at a time. So let's talk about the next uh, lesson learned. And we're going to jump all over the place, but this is lesson learned number four, and that is let it grow. So let me start here with an analogy. And I think this is an, a very powerful analogy that's helped me think about it. When a farmer, think back in the farm days, what do they do? First thing they have to do is they have to plow. Then they have to do all this work to plant the seeds but, and then water it, obviously. But at a certain point, it's up to the plants to grow. A, a farmer, 
he can't constantly be doing stuff. Sure, he could be doing little things to help the plants grow, but ultimately, once there's a lot of upfront work, just like there is an online business, and then there's a point where you have to step back and let the plants do its thing. And this is uh, something that's come up over and over again in my life because I tend to work very hard and I'm not always sure when I should be done. So the story from my life, I think the, the first story I'll tell at least, is when I first quit my job, I moved down. And I th- I'm hoping most of the people listening to this podcast know the basic version of my story. Let me, let me just sum it up quickly and then we'll get into the let it grow portion of the story. I had a, a core, and I think episode one of this podcast, you can go back to, I tell my story at length, but I had a, a corporate job and we'll talk about how bad it was, but I've never been, i never someone that gets depressed, but I fell into a pretty deep depression. I mean, I didn't ever, you know, get it diagnosed, but I felt terrible. Anyways, I ended up quitting that job, moving to, I was living in Chicago at the time, which was really cold and I'm from LA. So that was definitely a, an adjustment. I uh, ended up moving down to Miami. And this is probably one of the lowest points of my life. Like the, the last few weeks in Chicago and the f- first month or two in Miami were the lowest points of my life. And I was working really hard on my first company, B Dancewear, which is a dance clothing company I still have. But the thing was, and this is the funny part about it, I was working really hard, but it's unlike any kind of work I've ever done because my mind was so anxious and full of uncertainty that I, I, my gears were spinning. It was like a, it was like an engine, you know, where the, where where it's going, but there's no traction on the tires. Like it's just, it's not going anywhere because it's in the wrong gear or something like that. Anyways, one of the big turning points for me was when a friend came to visit me in Miami and he said, Hey, I'm going on this cruise around the Caribbean. You know, you want to come? And I said, no, no, like I'm busy. I got to, I'm not successful. I've quit my job and I haven't replaced my income and it's been a month. I should have it. I should have my income replaced by now, which is absolutely crazy. It, It takes quite a bit longer than that. Anyways, when I went on, I ended up going on this cruise and I, I've talked about this before, but shout out to my dad who I told, I kind of told him about this and he said, Hey, I'll pay for you to go on that cruise. You know, you, you've been working really hard, give your brain a break. And it was one of the best things I've ever done because what happened, I stopped working and two, three days went by and I didn't check my email for, you know, two or three days. And when I finally did check my email, they, the business was making some traction. The problem was I was working on B-Dancewear and it was like watching the grass grow. And it, it, if you imagine you're just sitting there staring at the grass grow, it doesn't feel like it's moving. But if you go away for a few days and you come back, you're like, oh yeah, look at it's growing a little bit. So if I were to write a book, I, I've thought about this for a long time, there's a good chance that it would be called Let It Grow. And it would be the art of working really hard and then letting it grow, walking, being able to walk away, detach a little bit, and seeing the fruits of your labor come out. There's, uh, this is a little off topic, but one of my favorite uh, quotes. I think it's from it's from some Hindu text or something like that. And the, I think it was like a god was saying it to like a person, and he basically said, "You are not entitled to the fruits of your labor. You're not entitled to the fruits of your labor." only the labor. And what that means to me, and I'm sure maybe there's a different interpretation, is that you should learn to enjoy the labor itself because you aren't promised the fruits. So in, in a, I guess that actually had nothing to do, <laughs> now that I think about with let it grow, it actually has a, a lot more to do with lesson number six, which obviously I'll talk about in a second. But to finish off lesson four, it's Basically, if you don't let things grow, you're going to, at least for myself, and once again, this podcast is for me five, ten years ago. If you don't learn to let it grow, you're going to burn yourself out over and over and over again. When you're done, walk, you know, move on to the next bucket. When you're done, it's time to let that business grow. You don't need to fight it. And as someone that always feels like it's not enough, I feel this need to keep fighting it. But once you are burned out, it's time to let it grow. 
Lesson five, and this is something that's recently uh, been very important to me. It's actually completely changed my life, and that is be grateful. You see this on Instagram. You see this. You hear this from like woo-woo, new agey people. You know, have an attitude of gratitude. Be grateful. Uh, all that kind of different things. And you actually, in the secret, if you've ever read the book, the secret they talk about it as well. And I feel like. A lot of people aren't doing this justice. This is such a powerful tool, but no one's properly explaining this. It took me a long, and I've read a lot of this kind of different stuff. I listened to some pretty out there podcasts, but no one ever really explained to me why gratitude is so powerful. And maybe it's one of those things that I needed to experience for myself. So I think there's a few different things, a few different ways for me to explain this. And maybe I'll start with how your perception, my perception of reality, your perception of reality is a completely made up one. Every second of every day, you're holding yourself to some kind of standard. For instance, let me tell you this. If you woke up and you were, you know, you woke up and you're in India and you're poor and then you got a chance to live the life that you're living now, you would be, that, that would be a dream come true. But yet for many Americans, many Western uh, people that live in Western societies, they're not fully satisfied. And this is especially true with entrepreneurs. It, was, it, it is and especially was true with myself. So if you can tweak your mindset and instead of looking at, oh, I wish I had this, I wish this was better, I wish whatever, because as long as you're sitting there wishing that things were better, you're never going to be happy. You're never going to be fully satisfied. And they talk about this. It's not that, you know, I'm a huge fan of the law of attraction or the secret, though it definitely interests me. It's definitely stuff that I'm interested in. They talk about if in the law of attraction, they say, for you to get what you want, you have to act like you already have it. And I always thought that was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard until I started doing it for myself. And and it's not necessarily something is out there. Is I feel like they make it sound in some of the woo-woo communities. An example of this is if you want to be have financial abundance, rather than thinking every day, I wish I had financial abundance, I wish I had financial abundance, it's changing your brain to think, holy cow, I do have financial abundance. I have enough money to do everything I want to do. And if you don't have every enough money to do everything you want to do, realize, holy cow, I have enough money to live a pretty darn good life and, and feeling and really feeling that appreciation and that gratitude. And that does amazing things to you and your brain. When you're able to transition into realizing that, holy cow, you already have what you want, great things happen. So let me tell you a an even more concrete example. This story blows my mind when I think about it. So a lot of you know that about a month ago, I got back from Italy. And something I haven't talked about too much is being in Italy and having um, dinner with my girlfriend. We had lots of dinners. I Sometimes what would happen is people would sit next to us and we'd start a conversation with them. And it was so much fun to have a really good dinner, some wine, and a really awesome conversation. And I thought to myself, you know what? When I get back home, I want that. I want better friendships and I want more group dinners. And that was my goal. So when I first got back, I was like, oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had this. But then I switched my mindset. And I don't know exactly how this came about, but I switched my mindset. Instead of saying, man, I wish I had friends that I could you know, get a weekly group dinner with, I started thinking, wow, I'm so grateful for the friends I do have. Because I do have some very amazing friendships. And what is crazy about that is within two, maybe at most three days of switching my mindset to that, I went out to lunch with a friend. And that led to a me, that friend, and a few other people going to the beach, a few more friends going to the beach. And I, I was introduced to a new friend on the beach that I've been hanging out with more often. And that led to us starting to get weekly group dinners. And this all changed in my mindset. It was because instead of thinking, man, I wish I had X, Y, and Z, feeling like I do have it. And what happened is when the opportunity presented itself and um, a friend texted me and said, hey, what, you know, what are you guys up to? I said to him, oh, we're going to go to the beach. You should join us. So my mind was tuned in and saw that opportunity. And then on the beach, we're like, hey, let's go for a hike. And then as we were driving, I was thinking, man, I, I have these amazing friendships. I'm really grateful for it. There's a place for dinner. 
we should all go get dinner together. And it just organically came about. And it's because I changed my mindset from thinking, I wish I had something to I do have something. So I'm not saying that this is, you know, definitely uh, for sure, like the law of attraction or something magical, spiritual, whatever. But there's something crazy to when you start feeling, you start changing how you feel, what happens in life. Let me, let me give you another example. Starting in January of this year, I started hitting my goal of making $300 passive income profit. I'm, I'm making probably closer to four or $500 a day. Uh, so $300 a day passive income profit. Sounds like, a, sounds like a course name right there. But what happened is at the beginning of January when I was making this, I didn't feel it inside. I didn't feel this thing. And it took me a few months of making it over and over again. And then all of a sudden, this summer was one of the best summers I've had in a long time. I started realizing I'm here. I'm experiencing it because for a long time at the beginning of this year, I was thinking, I wish I was making $300 a day when funny enough, I was already doing it. Or, or I'd say, I, was, I wish I made more money. But the truth is, why do I need to make more money? I have everything I want. And since that's happened, I felt like money has flowed in easier and easier into my life. Uh, another quick example is be the last example before we move into the next point is Funny enough, and this is another one of those kind of woo-woo stories, last year before I launched Performance Not Butter, I ended up meeting someone who self-identified as a psychic. She said, you know, she's got, she says she has some psychic um, traits, but she wasn't, you know, braggy about it or weird or whatever. She just said, hey, you know, I've, I kind of have this thing. And she asked me, oh, what do you, you know, what are you struggling with? And this was probably about August of last year. And I told her, you know, I, 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 if I had more money, my life would be better. And so she had these like 20 different cards that each had a different message on like what you should focus with or what your uh, affirmation should be. And I picked one and it said, I'm a money magnet. And she's like, look, that's crazy. Like that's the universe telling you, just start saying this. So I started writing down every day, like four or five times, I'm a money magnet. And I'd say this to myself, I'm a money magnet. I'm a money magnet. Once again, it's new agey, spiritually, whatever. But I'm like, no, let's try it full force. And at the time I was doing that, you know, I was probably making 40K a year. This was like last August. And maybe it was more, maybe it was less. I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. I didn't feel financially abundant. Started doing that. Bitcoin, which I've had since 2013, skyrocketed right around the same time. Um, my landlord it started It started forming that my landlord was going to buy me out, pay me a big chunk of money, 20 grand to move out of the apartment. And that was part of the reason that inspired me to move closer to Santa Monica, closer to the beach in my freaking dream location. At the same time, performance nut butter uh, started getting off the ground. And so it's as I started saying to myself, oh, and then my YouTube channel started making uh, 3K a month or something like that, just an, an insane amount of money. And this all happened, there, there's more to it probably than just that, don't get me wrong, but the the synchronicity, the, it was crazy to me that as I started saying to myself, I am a money magnet, and I truly believed it. I, I truly believe in life that, you know, you are whatever you want to believe. And I believe I'm someone that can make money. And I just never had that positive affirmation, those positive words never really flowed through my brain. It was constantly like, I can do this. I can do this. And then I switched it to, I am this person that just money is naturally attracted to me. And, you know, once again, feel free to tune out this part and just listen to some later things. But there's something freaking kind of crazy and magical about it. Scott Adams talks about it a lot. Uh, if you're he's the creator of Dilbert, he, he wrote a few different books. He's a huge skeptic. I'm a, I'm a huge scientist, but I think there is I mean, I studied, once again, I said biomedical engineering in college. I do believe that there is more to this reality than just a materialistic point of view. And physics proves that, but maybe we'll talk about that later. That might be part three, once I've gotten you a little bit deeper into my web. Anyways, just be grateful. Whether it's a neuroscience thing, whether it is a spiritual thing, whether it's just a psychological thing, whatever it is, when you change your mind into focusing on how happy you are for the things you have, amazing things happen. And currently, I'm being grateful for a lot of things, but one of the things is my YouTube audience. 
uh, for a long time, I've, I've been, my YouTube and podcast audience, for a long time, I've thought to myself, oh, I wish I had a bigger YouTube audience. I wish I had a bigger podcast. But now I'm really doing my best to try to focus on how grateful I am for you. Right now, you're listening to this. And a few months ago, I discounted that. But right now, there is someone, hopefully you, listening to this, and maybe multiple people. Maybe it's only 100 people, which doesn't sound like a lot to a big-name podcaster or YouTuber. That's amazing. And instead of thinking, wow, uh, I have a friend that's getting 1,500 views uh, per YouTube episode, and I'm only getting 300, I start thinking, I'm trying to start thinking, I'm getting 300. That's so amazing. So this is kind of a public declaration. Please watch over the course of the next six months as my YouTube audience grows. And another point on on this is by switching that mindset, it's going to keep me going for longer because rather than thinking, I don't have enough you know, people on YouTube, I don't have enough people listening to my podcast. I'm going to be thinking, wow, it's so amazing that I have what I have. Let's keep doing this. Otherwise, it's very easy for me to get burnt out. So as you can tell, I could talk about this for a long time, but let's move into lesson number six, and that is be unattached from outcomes. And this is another one of those things from the law of attraction style things. One of my favorite books of all time, I highly recommend everybody check it out, is Think and Grow Rich. This book changed my life. It also kind of, it was like, I think, spurred on the self-development um spurred on self-development or what do you call self-help genre. It's like the first, the granddaddy of the self-help. It's also the granddaddy of like the law of attraction, all that stuff. But let me talk about um, what I I mean. And there's a lot of different stories once again on this. I think as someone that's, I'm personally very goal-driven, but my biggest successes, some of my biggest successes have been when I'm unattached from outcome. And you know, I think early in life, I had the goal of getting into a certain college or doing a certain thing. And, you know, if, if you want to go to USC, which was my dream school, then there's kind of only like really one path. But sometimes better things come. You know, actually, I, I'm kind of doubting that as I'm saying it. Anyway, let me tell you the story of how I made 150K. Uh, it looks like this year I should make at least 150K. So if, since I quit my job, I've had this goal of making $300 a day passive income. But then I realized three hundred dollars passive, uh, three hundred dollars a day passive income is about a hundred k. Why don't I make my goal one hundred fifty k in a year? So for the past few years, at the beginning of each year, I write down goals. I write down ten goals that I'd like to achieve. And for the past few years, I've written on there make one hundred fifty thousand dollars this year. And you know what would happen? I would grind and grind, and I'd st- I'm like I want to get that one hundred fifty k. My path to do it is my dance clothing company, B Dance, where I'm just going to go down this path. And what would happen is it was like hitting my head against a freaking brick wall. It was just like I'd, I'd run full speed into a brick wall. I'm like, hey, that didn't work. Let's try again. And I'd get up and run full speed into that brick wall over and over and over again. This year, 2018, for the first time, I did not, for the first time in a while at least, I did not write down anything about how much money I wanted to make. Instead, I said, I want to do like I had a, I had some work for performance now, but I'm like, I just want to do the work. I just want to get things done. So rather than saying, I want to make a certain amount, it's like, I have the power to control certain things. I have zero power to control how much money I make. And this is where the story of you're entitled to your labor, but not the fruits of your labor comes in. I know I can plant seeds. I know I can water it. Whether that grows a beautiful, bountiful tree is not up to me. So why am I so attached to this specific outcome? So by letting go of that, and once again, make of this what you will, I'm going to hit almost exactly 150K this year. That is mind-boggling to me. The first time I let go of this idea is the first time I achieve almost that exact number. I'll have to, we'll see at the end of the year exactly how much it is, but I'm on track for almost exactly that. And this is an example of being unattached from the outcome. Like I I wasn't, because if I would have been super attached to making 150K and that was my only concern, what would happen is I might be trying to hit my head against the brick wall, trying to run through the brick wall instead of realizing, oh, I can just walk around it. And you hear these kind of stories all the time, but I think once you experience it for yourself, it becomes even more um, true. You realize it even more. Let me give you another example that might make more sense even. I was held, I, I, a little while ago, I uh, brought on this kid as a mentor. I, I was his mentor. I was men- he was my mentee. 
I was teaching them how to start a passion product business. And if you listen to my podcast, if you watch my YouTube channel, you know this is kind of the new direction I'm going in. This is like the method I found out for making money that I truly believe in. So uh, this is what performance and upload are. It's the idea of find something you really believe in, make it unique, different, create a brand around it. It's what I did for performance and upload that's worked out extremely well. It's what my girlfriend, I'm teaching her to do for Vino Cards. And this is what I was teaching this kid to do for his bracelet company. And I was really excited about it. I wanted him to be a huge success. So I put all this energy into him and, and we'd sit and we'd talk and he said, hey, I have this idea for a drop shipping bracelet company. I'm like, that's silly. Like, I don't want to help you. I'm, I'm all about the passion products. And he said, okay, cool. Let's, let's do a passion product. So he had this idea for a bracelet. Million dollar idea. I, I forget exactly what it was right now. But I remember telling him that idea is great. Let's do it. Let's run with it. And so we started working on it a little bit. I was giving him a ton of what I thought were brilliant ideas. And a week or two goes by and I talked to him and he said, actually, never mind. We're going to go in a different direction. And I'm like, okay, that new direction is really good too. That, that could also work. Another million dollar idea. I spent a ton of energy, time on the phone with him, really trying to help him out. Then what happened? Another week went by and he changed the direction again. And I'm like, all right, but we found an even better idea. So every time like something bad would happen, we found a better idea and I'm like, oh, this is amazing, whatever. And so the time comes where he's about to launch it. It's two days before launch and he decides to completely pivot again in a direction that I think is ridiculous. And the Kickstarter totally flops. So at this point, I feel like I had just wasted my time. I feel 100%. I had this outcome of this bracelet's going to be successful. It's going to prove out the passion product model. And, you know, I'm going to whatever. Like, uh, I'm going to be able to sell a course and make a million dollars teaching people my amazing model. So I was completely attached to that outcome. I ended up working with a, a coach in Santa Monica who is a little bit actually funny enough, uh, more on the woo-woo spiritual side. And when I was telling him this story and I said, wow, this kid just wasted my time. He said to me, how do you know that? How do you know that was a waste of your time? How do you know that wasn't exactly what you were supposed to do? Maybe the outcome I was supposed to get from that was uh, that lesson. Maybe the outcome I was supposed to get from that, I ended up buying one of his bracelets, was buying that bracelet. And that bracelet will be a reminder to me, the ultimate idea that the last idea that I was happy that we settled on for the, the bracelet idea was that you create your own reality. And I thought this was great. I thought this was a bracelet to remind you every day that you are creating your reality. Whether you're thinking about how grateful you are for something or how bad something is, that reality, you're creating it in that moment. And this is true all the time. When you eat food, when you there's been the studies about drinking wine and how if you think it's more expensive, it tastes better. You are constantly creating your, there's no set definition of what, oh, that's true reality. You are creating it. And I thought that was such a brilliant, beautiful thing. So I was attached to this outcome of him being successful. Maybe that's not what I was supposed to learn. You know, and, and there's so much complexity to this universe that maybe what I was really supposed to, maybe this conversation, this podcast, this story is going to inspire someone. Who knows? But the whole idea was, I'm trying to be less attached from the outcome because that's just, it, it's bad. It, it makes you, it's the sunk cost fallacy. You start spending money after bad money or you spend good money after bad money when you're too attached to a certain outcome. Instead, be like water, uh, go with the flow. Bruce Lee says, you know, you want to be like water. Water never spends more energy doing something than it needs to. If there's an obstacle in its way, it goes around it or over it or whatever. All right. So lesson number seven, so let's get back to a little bit more tactical, a little bit less on the woo woo side. And lesson number seven is you can't do it by yourself. And I wish I could go back in time and shake myself. So if you are out there trying to be the solo entrepreneur, Mr. Me against the world or she against the world, I guess. I don't know. It still would be me. <laughs> you can't do it by yourself. It's, it's, it's so crazy. We have this idea of Western society of the lone wolf going out and conquering the world by themselves. No, you absolutely, it, it's, so and even if you can't, even if you're listening to this right now and said, you don't know me, I'm so smart, I'm so this, it's easier with a posse. It's easier with a group of friends. Uh, there's a reason in you know movies, like you think of Star Wars, for instance, or any of these movies of the hero's adventure style movie, hero's journey, excuse me, they always have some sidekicks. They always have some side characters because it just makes it easier. Everyone has different skills in life. So this is a very subtle mindset 
that I think uh, a lot of people have where they want to lock themselves in a room. My, I, I talked about earlier, my first real mentor slash friend that was an entrepreneur very much had this mindset at first. Well, actually, no, I shouldn't say that because he ended up hiring someone. But at first, I think he had it and it kind of felt like lock yourself in a room and get work done by yourself. You don't need other people. But the truth is you absolutely do and it's so much easier. Having people on your side, on your team is just a force multiplier. Another aspect of this, and this could have been its own lesson, is friendships and relationships are hugely, hugely important. I can't emphasize this enough. I thought when I first quit my job, that's fine. I don't need anybody else. I'm gonna go lock myself in a room and do this by myself. But guess what? You get lonely. You get so lonely. So if you're about to be embarking on an entrepreneurial journey, you have no idea how lonely it is uh, if, if you don't properly prioritize friendships and relationships. There's something just energy giving about having people, friends in your life that you can go hang out with. We are primates. We're, we are, you know, fancy monkeys basically. And we need social circles back, um, 10,000, no, hundred thousand years ago, let's say 10,000 plus years ago, back in hunter, hunter gatherer times. If you were not part of a tribe, your chance of survival was so low. It's ridiculous. Our brain is set up to have a reward system, dopamine spikes, serotonin spikes. When we engage in social bonding, when we have relationships, because and we're, we're, and we're, we see, we're supposed to seek that out. That's why loneliness can be this crippling thing. And despite the fact that we live in a modern society and there's, you know, people, uh, no, if you live in a major city, there's people all around you. If you don't have a real relationship with you, if you don't have people that have your back and you can reciprocate and have their back, your brain down regulates its serotonin. I'm, I'm telling you this from personal experience. Um, I'll, I'll tell a, a, a quick story when I first, so I, I talked earlier about moving and, and traveling all around. First off, that, that was, a, it was a much more lonely experience than I would probably normally admit, but let's, I'm opening up here. But then on top of it, one of the more, even more lonely was that I did finally move back to Santa Monica. I, I moved here, I think August of 2016. That sounds right. Yeah. August, 2016, I moved back here and pretty much all my friends had moved or they were in, you know, really committed relationships. I didn't have any good friendships. And that was so tough because what would happen is I'd been working all week long and it's Friday night and there's nothing to do. I don't have any friends to go out with. I don't have any, uh, you know, anything to do except for sit in my room. Sure, I could go to a bar by myself, but that's actually more lonely. When you have to go to a bar by yourself and um, try to make friends, it, sure, there's a chance that it works out, but when it doesn't work out, that is probably the most lonely, miserable experience. And then the, this all, didn't always happen, but there would be weekends, you know, it'd be Saturday or Sunday, and there's just nothing to do. And that's a terrible feeling. When you want to relax, you want to get out of the house, but you have no motivation to. And that is why relationships are so important. Uh, I, there was a, during that time, there was a person that I was friends with who every time I'd try to hang out, he was a, a new entrepreneur. He had just recently quit his job. And every time I'd want to hang out with him, he'd basically say, Hey, I'm too busy on my business. I'm too, you know, grinding, grinding, grinding. And it reminded me of when I first started and it was terrible to watch. And maybe, you know, maybe he was fine. But for me, that mindset is toxic. Thinking that, Oh, um, sure. I could go hang out with you, but I'd rather, I'd rather be working on my business. Hanging out with people, especially if they're other entrepreneurs should give you more energy. It should clear your mind. And it does. When I go hang out with some friends, my mind becomes a little clearer. I get to talk out some of my issues, some of my anxieties, or at least forget about them. And my subconscious is able to take some time and solve them. So definitely, uh, prioritize all all relationships. And another note is make sure that all relationships are mutual, mutually beneficial and respect the relationship. There was a, once again, a, a guy I was I friends with and I knew, but it felt like every time he wanted to hang out, it's because he wanted something from me. And every time I'd feel a little bit lopsided, I felt like he got the better end of the deal. And that's not a good way. Like a, a true friendship should be a little bit selfless. And obviously this takes time, but you shouldn't be keeping score. You shouldn't be counting. And this is something that was very, once again, hard for me. So I think in this 
particular individual, I saw a lot of negatives in him that I possess and I'm trying to get rid of. So don't think to yourself, he, uh, this person actually said this to me and I think this is much more common. I was like, hey, let's go get some lunch. And he's like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think it's worth the money. And I don't think he was fully aware of what he was saying, but he's basically saying it's not worth $12 to go hang out with you. And it's not like he said, oh, let's just go hang out on my couch instead for free. He was basically, and then, you know, he basically said, it's not worth an hour of my life to hang out with you. To me, that's like, well, look, if that's how you feel, if it's not worth $12 or an hour of your life to hang out with me, you obviously don't understand the power of relationships. And for me growing up in high school, all my friends would go out to lunch and I'd bring my own food because... I was too cheap. A lot of times I'd eat by myself. I'm like, yeah, you guys go out. I'm going to eat my own food because I was too cheap to spend my money to go out to lunch with them. When in fact, it's not about the food. It's about those relationships. So now I'm trying to prioritize relationships. And that means, like I said earlier, going out to dinner with friends, uh, I, you know, having quality time, spending my most precious resources, pre- my most precious, spending my most precious resource, which is my time on these friends, which ends up giving me much more value. All right, so I beat that to death. Let's move on to the intelligence of emotions. So I got another brutal story here. This was one of the hardest fought lessons. So the intelligence, like understanding the intelligence of emotions. I thought for a long time, logic was all that matters. Emotions were ridiculous. And I think this is partially based on definitions. You think of someone getting emotional and you think, oh, they're they're not thinking clearly. And there, there can be truth to that at a time. I think that's an extreme. So just like you can be too logical and not see the nuances, we've all heard someone say something that might be factually correct, but it's so insensitive to the person that you they just don't realize the value of tapping into that emotion. But that's not just what I'm talking about here. So there's a lot of different things I'm, I'm talking about in this. And one of them is sometimes you have a gut feeling about something. Sometimes you might say, hey, logically, the best way for me to make money is to continue working on Be Dancewear. But your gut is saying, you really should start this new company, Performance Nut Butter. But you're thinking, well, no, 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 logically, um, I've already spent this much resources with Be Dance where it's already making me $10,000 uh, or whatever it is. Why would I try to start some new thing from scratch? That just doesn't make sense on paper. But there's something uh, emotionally that's drawing you towards this. So let's really quickly understand what are emotions. From a neuroscience perspective, logic comes from your neocortex or your prefrontal cortex. And you know it's a part of your brain. Emotions also come from a part of your brain, your limbic system. It's a much deeper, um, ancient part of your brain. But when you feel an emotion, that's a part of your brain logicking out stuff. The way neurons work is it's basically ones or zeros. So it's still logic, but there's so much calculations going on that you can't, you can't understand it all. It's happening in your subconscious, right? So the way you experience it is through an emotion. So when you feel a certain emotion, that is your brain saying, hey, we've done a ton of calculations and this is what's going on. Now, emotions can be tricked and, and, and sure, I personally think they can get out of control. Just like I said, logic can get out of control. People can get, they can tap in too much into their emotions and, and cry about something rather than finding a, a clear solution to it. But at the same time, people might try to find solutions to things where sometimes the real solution is just changing your emotional state uh, and, and then this is kind of going off on a tangent. And before we move on, I think one of the ways that emotions can be really powerful or your gut is in these split section, second decisions. There's stories, you hear about this kind of stuff all the time. There's like a story, stories of firefighters walking into a building and they're going around and something feels off. Logically, they have no idea what's wrong. But something feels off and they evacuate and get everyone out of the building and the building collapse. Later, they're able to logic it and say, oh, well, the temperature was a little too high and the ground felt hot. So I knew that the, this building was structurally, like the fire was a weird kind of fire or whatever, whatever weird thing it was. But in the moment, their logical part of their brain brain can't process that fast enough, but what you know what can? That ancient emotional system. Or sometimes you meet someone and you just feel like I don't wanna I don't wanna hang out with that person. I don't like that person. Logically, there's nothing that they did that was wrong. But that you know a lot of times, not always, this can be this can be tricked, but a lot of times that's something Maybe that person was making a micro expression or the tone of their voice. You've seen this pattern before and you know that this is an untrustworthy type of 
tone of voice or whatever it is, trusting your gut, especially I've found this with hiring people. When you hire someone, you get this gut feeling of they're a good person to work with or they're not. And trusting that is something you hear over and over again, but yet still and it saddens me with this sign, all the science that we have and stuff. We want to think that logic is the only way to go. It's not. So understanding that your emotions are actually extremely intelligent and that you should listen to them. Now, maybe they're, they're telling you a different story. Maybe they're telling you, hey, don't trust that person because he reminds you of someone else and it's totally infactual, but it's definitely those emotions are very intelligent. All right, we got two more lessons here. We're going to wrap up in a little bit, but these two ones are pretty important, so stay tuned. Lesson number nine, have pillars. Have pillars. And, you know, obviously pillars hold up a, a building, but what I mean by this is I like to look at a calendar. I like to plan out certain events. So I know, for instance, February the second or the first, second, third week of February, I'm taking those weeks off. So everything else I do is planned around that. That's a pillar. Every just like in a uh, in an office or a building, there's pillars, and you can't say, "Oh, I want a couch there. I'm gonna get rid of the pillar." No, that pillar needs to be there because that's what's holding up the building. So you build around it. So for me, this could be a lot of different things. This could be, like I said, vacations. This could be a special launch date. Maybe I say this date, April 22nd is the perfect day. April 23rd, I think, is going to be when the passion product formula or whatever I end up naming it ends up being launched. That is the date it's going to launch. Now, let's look backwards. Let's figure everything out. Let's make sure that I can get everything done so that this product gets launched. And for me personally, by having that pillar there, I know it's going to be uh, I, I, it's my best chance of being successful. It's very similar to earlier when I was talking about focus on one variable at a time. If you don't have those pillars and you say to yourself, okay, well, I'll take a vacation whenever um, whenever I'm ready to, you're never going to be ready to. But by saying, it's artificial constraints is what it is. You're making your brain work with inside a box because if it has to work with that, within the infinity that is the universe, it's very hard to solve an equation with an infinite number of solutions. It's much easier when you constrain it and say, hey, there's a million different solutions. Which one of these million is the best? But if you say there's an infinite number of solutions, which one of these infinite are the best? It's very hard. There's a lot of other benefits to doing this. When you plan out a vacation uh, a few months ahead of time and say, this is the time for vacation, it allows you to prioritize. It allows you to say, I don't have infinite amount of time. I only have three months till I take a month off. What do I need to get done? I need to get done all this junk. Let's make sure uh, that the important stuff gets done. Do I want to waste my time with this? No, because it's not that important. It's not going to really move the sales needle. So I think having pillars is something that I've been doing a lot of uh, recently, and it's been very, very helpful for me. I I probably talk about that one a lot more. And I think there's other related lessons learned throughout this that are similar, but I'm going to cut that one there. And lesson number 10, This is another extremely hard fought thing. And it's an ideology that I'm only recently starting to get my head around. And meditation has helped a lot with this. But I think this is a very powerful tool. And that's go with the flow. We kind of have talked about this in this podcast. But I'm usually very much someone that says, I'm at point A, I want to get to point B, period. I'm going to take a straight line. And that sounds like, yeah, straight line's the the quickest path, sure. But let's say you're going from LA to New York and you say, I'm going to take a straight line. Let's just for ease of sake, let's say you're walking from LA to New York and you know it's going to be a whatever, a month long journey. I don't know how long that takes. And you say, I'm going to walk in a straight line. Good luck. It's going to take you a long time. You'd be much better off going with the flow and taking the appropriate roads and, you know, maybe stopping along the way. at hotels to rest when you feel like it. Because if you go in a straight line from LA to New York, you're gonna have to go over a lot of mountains, climb a lot of fences, uh, find yourself in a lot of areas without hotels and barren lands. And it's just not the wisest decision. It's it's much, much wiser to go with the flow. Now, that being said, I think it's important to have a, a, a direction you're going to. If you're starting in LA and you say, I'm just gonna go with the flow, for me personally, that's a terrible idea because I'll just go in circles and I'll just like, I'll never ever make it anywhere. Now, different personality types, that's very different for. I have a friend, Jordan, who if you go to the How to, uh, How to Do Your 20s podcast, he was my last ever interview. He's much better at going with the flow. He doesn't need a direction, I think, as much as I do. 
Um, another example of this is when I first, so after Miami, I don't, I guess I didn't finish the story after Miami, I, I went back home for about a month and then I went and traveled around South America on and off for a year and a half or so. And I was in Peru and I decided to buy a one way ticket and then I was just going to go with the flow. And that was so hard for me because every morning I'd wake up and I'd be thinking, what do I want to do today? Do I want to stay in this city? Do I want to move on to the next city? I like having some kind of a direction but once again, if I fight too hard and one, if I fight too hard and don't go with the flow, I, it leads to burnout. Let me give you another story, another example to really solidify this idea. Imagined you're dropped in the middle of the ocean, and you see two islands. One island that's close and it's full of amazing-looking food and just all this, you know, all this beautiful abundance. And there's another island. It looks green, but you can't really see it. And so you're swimming towards this island that's, you know, close and full of great, you know, looking food. And as you're swimming, you know, you can feel the current fighting against you. But whatever, you you want to get there. It's so close. Like, let, let's just do it. And it's got all this great food. All right, uh, a day goes by, whatever, and you, you swim again. And our hours go by, I don't know, whatever you want to say. And you keep swimming, and you keep swimming, and you keep tying yourself out. And then eventually you just let go and you go with the flow and you start swimming towards the other island because that's where the current's taking you. Well, that's a much better island. Who knows? Maybe on the other side of that island, there is a, you know, a refueling depot and you can get saved. Who knows? Maybe there is a lot of abundance. Just because it's farther away doesn't mean you can't see it. And that's kind of one of those examples of going with the flow to me because if you would have kept swimming toward that first island that seemed closer, you would drown. And it's just being aware. You know, and there's not always a hard and fast rule. Maybe that current's just a light current. If it's only a light current, then sure, swim to that. But you have no idea. I have no idea. Nobody has any idea of what the future holds. So when you say, this is the only way, I want to make a million dollars and it's got to be this way, sometimes the universe does weird stuff. And whether you want to believe in higher powers, the universe, spiritual, any of that stuff, it doesn't matter. You can kind of feel when something is putting up too much resistance and not necessarily saying you should quit, but you should see what new direction it takes you in. It's, uh, you can tell I love my analogies. You're flowing down a river and sometimes you want to, you see this point in the distance you want to go to and the river keeps forking into a bunch of other rivers. Sometimes it's easier rather than exhausting yourself just to like let it go and, and, and switch to a different fork in the river, switch to a different part of the river when it's easier rather than when it's super difficult and tough. So like I said, I, I use a lot of analogies with this. Let me read off um, what all 10 of the lessons learned were, but I'm hoping this is helpful for you guys. And my email is travis at effectiveecommerce.com. Please, please email me if there's something here that meant something to you, or if there's something you feel like I didn't say, or if you disagree with me, I don't even care. Just email me. I'd love to hear from you. This is I spent a ton of time thinking about this. Uh, and one thing I forgot to mention was basically at the beginning, at the end and beginning of each year, I spend a bunch of time reviewing the previous year and, and seeing what were the biggest lessons learned. And this is kind of the condensed down version of all those, all those lessons. So this is part one. There'll be two more parts here. And let's go over the different lessons from today. What works for others may not work for you. Lesson two, have multiple buckets. Three, focus on one variable at a time. Your brain is not meant to calculate infinite variables. It's just not a good way of doing math. Uh, lesson four, let it grow. Lesson five, be grateful. Lesson six, be unattached from the outcomes. Lesson seven, you can't do it by yourself, so stop trying. There's someone listening, you probably right now, the 99 or 95% chance that you listening right now are trying to do more by yourself than you need to. If we can hire a virtual assistant, get friends, whatever, whatever that means to you, take that jump. Lesson eight, the intelligence of emotions. Realize that emotions are very intelligent. And when you see someone expressing their emotions, understand that that is the same part. Of, that's the same brain that is making your logic. There's not that one is better than the other. They're just different. Uh, lesson nine, have pillars, create pillars in your life. And lesson 10, go with the flow. So once again, those are the lessons. Guys, if you haven't yet, go check out the How to Do Your 20s podcast. I have a bunch of, I, I, it's an interview style. And it's kind of cool because you can see like my first episode, I think it's still up. You can see like the evolution in me and my story. So if, if, if that's something you're interested in, go check that out. Definitely, if you listen to this, check out the YouTube channel. 
Um, probably have some other stuff going on. I don't know. And if you're listening to this in the future and you do want to get those how to do your 20s episode, make sure that you can go to effectiveecommerce.com and you can sign up for the e-commerce success pack. I'll, I'll put all the old podcast episodes in there. That's pretty much it guys. Uh, oh, actually no, one big thing go on every month. I pick a new person to do a one-on-one free consulting session with. And even if you don't want the consulting session, still just go to iTunes, leave a five-star review. When you leave that five-star review, you'll be entered for a chance to win a new one-on-one consulting session. I think in part two, I'll answer, I'll announce the, this month's winner for that consulting session. But by leaving that five-star review in iTunes, it absolutely helps me out. It helps me get better guests on the podcast because if I only have one review on iTunes, they're going to look at me and say, nah, I'm not going to come on your show. If I have a thousand, they're like, yeah, I would love to come on your show. So I'll get better guests. Plus you get a chance to win a free one-on-one consulting session. So go to iTunes, leave that five-star review. And next week I'm going to be coming out with some more lessons learned, 30 lessons learned before I turn 30. Thank you guys. And I'll talk to you guys next time.